I'm Marguerite Green, and I am so lucky to moderate these amazing people on this panel tonight. Um, so you are joining us for a power shift panel on careers, specifically careers in agriculture. I'm with my people tonight. Um, I myself am a farmer, but I also run a nonprofit or executive direct. A lot of other people run it. Um, uh, called Sprout NOLA here in New Orleans, we do farmer and gardener technical assistance and training. Um, but I really want to focus on the amazing folks that are here tonight and, and the wisdom that they're going to share with us about their career path. Um, I will say I use she, her pronouns. And uh, as I kick it to the panelists to introduce themselves, if they would like to add their pronouns, that would be great. And um, then also, I am coming to you all from, um, you know, occupied Chinamacha and Choctaw land here in New Orleans, um, what was called Bulbansha. And, um, and I heard someone say this on a panel the other day, and I think it's really important, especially when we're conceiving of climate solutions, is that those folks are still here. Um, so it is occupied land and, um, and I am blessed to get to love this land here. And if any of the other panelists know the land that they're occupying or, you know, no, no pressure if you don't, but if you'd like to throw that in there as well. Um, and I guess I'll start it off by sending it over to my friend in New Orleans. Kai, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, yeah. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Kai Nguyen. I work with uh, Veggie Farmers Cooperative. It's a group of uh, uh, Vietnamese farmers in New Orleans East. And um, yeah, just uh, we, we help them um, with a community farm. We help them uh, grow and sell their food to farmers markets, restaurants. Um, and I've been working with them for about 10 years now. Actually, today's the 11th year anniversary of the BP oil spill, which was kind of the catalyst for, for Veggie to start. But um, I guess I can tell you guys about that more in, in our conversation. Um, awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, Lauren, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Thanks, Margie. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lauren Newman. I use she, her pronouns. And I am the Youth Entrepreneurship Cooperative Program Manager at City Blossoms. I like to just say YEC Program Manager because that's a mouthful, but basically what that means is um, I have the pleasure of working with high school students all across the DC um, area um, who run their own youth cooperative business called Mighty Greens and they utilize the um, green spaces, so the gardens and the greenhouses at their schools um, to push forward their mission to um, improve access to fresh and locally grown um, produce in, in their communities. So um, I'll definitely be explaining a little bit more about our, our work like as the panel goes on, but um, just really thankful to be here um, and also listen to the wisdom of, of my co-panelists. Amazing, thank you so much for that intro. Um, Naima, would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, um, hi everyone. My name is Naima Dore, uh, born in Somalia, raised in America all over. Um, I don't really have a particular state to claim, but I've been calling Minnesota home for the past 20 years. And as many of you know, uh, with the recent verdict, a little bit over an hour ago now, um, I'm still shaking, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just emotional, um, sense of relief, accountability is very, very important. And uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, so I am the executive director of Somali American Farmers Association and the owner of Naima's Farm. I'm in the process of purchasing a land. Um, I don't know particularly in this land that I'm going through the process and purchasing um, to the original people and the people that still reside there. So I'm digging every day and trying to learn that process. Um, but I believe right now I'm in Dakota land. Amazing. Thank you for that intro. And um, now Roman and um, if Adriana Wilcox is here as well with Roman, if you all want to, uh, you know, I'm sure you know how to introduce 
yourselves together if you are a married couple. <laughs> unmute, babe. You have to unmute. She needs my help on that one. All right. That's Adriana. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Roman Wilcox, and uh, I go by he and him. And babe? I'm Adriana Wilcox. <laughs> uh, I go by she, her, my pronouns. And I believe we're on Apache land. There was a really cool app that allowed me to look that up recently. So that's what I found out. <laughs> yeah. So um, we are the co-founders of Planty for the People. And uh, Adriana, my wife, is the executive director. And she is also like the numero uno bad chick in town because she has really taken this whole um, this whole undertaking of what we're doing and I'm gonna have her explain it because she could do it way better than I ever could. Um, but as the executive director, but also as as the farmer, which of uh, which is happens to be right behind me, and uh, we have fifty three um, garden beds that are all raised. That there's a great a sto great story behind it, but we've been um, privileged enough to take it on and. I do one part of it, but Adriana really, you want to just fill them in, babe? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, well, I think we're just doing introductions for now, and then we'll go right. into like the organization and all that later, right? So, so Roman handles more so our um, vegan dining restaurant, which is indoors, um, and the space came with a lot of space to grow food. So we started a 501c3 nonprofit called Planty for the People. So Roman's the chef. I do not do any of the cooking. We're all better off that way. Um, but you'll find me in the garden. Um, and so I can talk a lot more about our programming when we get to that as well. Amazing. Thank you so much. And um, I think we can kind of weave the structure of our organizations in, you know, we have an hour and I feel like with what everyone does, honestly, I want to hear 25 minutes from each person about just their organization. Um, so just because we have some structural challenges to that, if you could kind of make sure to frame your answers within a context of what you would like us to know about your work, um, I think would be wonderful. So I'm gonna open with the first question, which is what made you decide to become what you are? What gave you this idea to have a career in agriculture? Um, and then an alternate spin on that is, uh, you know, if you don't really know, then when did you get the idea that you wanted to be participatory in agriculture? And um, yeah, and Kai, I heard you say, you know, it is the 11th anniversary of the BP oil spill. And I know that that was sort of a part of the formation of Veggie. Um, would you mind answering the question first? Sorry, I was muted. But um, uh, like Marie was saying earlier, I'm in New Orleans as well. And I grew up in a, a Vietnamese community out here. And um, this community kind of had like a big, um, like many people in New Orleans were affected by um, Hurricane Katrina. And there were a lot of like environmental justice fights around the aftermath of the Hurricane Katrina. And I wasn't really involved in that, but with the BP oil spill, um, so many people in our community were affected because people were in, involved in the fishing industry. And I just felt like, hey, you know, like I wasn't, I needed to be part of like, to, to, I need to help out my community in some way. Um, and so I just started volunteering at a local organization um, doing work around um, uh, compensation from the BPO spill. And then um, from that um, the organization, um, I started working with the organization to kind of figure out like, how do we help these community members um, kind of deal with the effects of the oil spill? Like they're losing their money, but we knew that a lot of people in our community were really passionate about growing food, about farming. And so um, the organization, uh, I, started, I started working with the organization to really build up this idea of how do we do a workforce development project around, based around urban agriculture. Because a lot of people were already growing food, um, 
how do we get them to actually earn income from it? And so that's how Veggie Farmers Cooperative started. And um, the idea came up, like, like I said, around like 10, 11 years at this point. Um, and so we just started working with community members that were somehow involved in the fishing industry, um, got some funding to build some greenhouses in their backyards. And then eventually a couple of years later, we, we built, out a, built out a community farm. And so basically for my, my involvement just became came about because you know, I grew up in the community. I wanted to help out in some way. And then like, it, it just so happened that like, we were able to get, find this opportunity where we knew that people were interested in farming and we just ran with it. Um, and it's still going, it's still, it's still, we're still doing um, okay today. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, Naima, are you uh, willing to also answer that question? Yeah, you know, um, I kind of stumbled on this career by accident, uh, mainly because I was interested in, um, you know, what I was feeding my first child who was transitioning into solid food. So um, for me, you know, not having access to a farmer's market in this particular city that I lived at the time uh, was just, you know, concerning that, you know, organic food, I thought everything was actually organic, all vegetables and fruits. So I had an aha moment, very teachable moment, because coming from a different country, having access to fresh produce all the time, fresh and organic and clean, I just didn't realize that a lot of our produce was not <laughs> the case. And so I just started growing microgreens inside my tiny apartment and quickly realized that's just not sustainable. And um, so I got creative. So we transitioned to a community garden and then um, later on was able to learn about a program called Minnesota Food Association. It's called Big River Farms right now out in Stillwater area, St. Croix here in Minnesota, uh, which was a training program for first time farmers, immigrant farmers that are interested in uh, exploring that industry. So my husband and I and our two little children enrolled the program and we would commute three hours round trip uh, for three years. We completed uh, three years as a farmer certified organically. And we've been doing it since then. And now this year we're looking into, uh, hopefully fingers crossed that uh, we will have our own land. Uh, by end of June, uh, not end of June, end of July, excuse me. Um, and, you know, I just had an aha moment one day at the field, uh, my second year of growing. And I realized, you know, as a Somali woman, you know, we have a business background, many of us um, was like, oh, wow, not only can I make this as a full time career, hopefully, which I'm still working towards that I still have my day job, literally joining you right now from <laughs> my workspace. Um, that, you know, I could potentially transition to this uh, career and, um, and educate my community as well, who, you know, many of us are uh, accustomed to eating fresh food all the time, which is not the case for many of the community that reside here, so. Amazing, thank you for sharing that. Um, Lauren, would you mind sharing with us? Yeah, I'd love to. So, um, I guess you could say that I got my start fairly early on. Um, and I was lucky uh, to have stumbled upon actually City Blossoms um, community green space in, in my hometown of DC when I was just, I think I was 10 going on 11 years old. Um, and prior to that, I didn't really understand the connection between where my food comes from outside of the grocery store. <laughs> um, and, you know, especially growing up in an urban environment like DC, um, I mean, community gardens have definitely become more prolific uh, since I was like 10. Um, but back then it was like a novelty. And I walked into that garden and just was mesmerized and they couldn't stop me from coming back. <laughs> so I just came back year after year um, and was really thankful for the mentorship and the intentional experiences that City Blossoms provided for me um, when I was in high school. Um, I participated in a lot of internships with them um, and really like 
strengthened like key professional development like um and then that kind of like led to me deciding that I wanted to study environmental sustainability with a focus on local food systems uh, when I went to college. Um, and when I was thinking about what my thesis could possibly be um, for my capstone project, I kind of went back to my roots and decided, you know, I have to go back home um, and really look at how urban agriculture nonprofits um, can play a really big role in creating safe, um, safe green spaces for young people. But in that process, I started to really look at like the, the effects that gentrification was having on the accessibility and quite frankly, the, uh, how welcoming these spaces were, um, or not uh, to uh, communities of color. Um, and so I kind of shifted my topic and um, worked with several different nonprofits in DC through the summer of 2017 um, and really just like shadowed and interviewed community members, interviewed executive um, like staff of nonprofits and tried to develop a list of best practices that urban agriculture like nonprofits could follow um, to, to ensure that their spaces remain accessible um, for um, low income communities or communities of color. Um, and then that kind of just was my introduction to Mighty Greens, which is the, the program that I now run within City Blossoms. Um, the students just kind of took my breath away, um, just how motivated and um, how much they knew uh, about growing and how much like their cultures like really just shined through um, the stories that they told each other and like how they utilize the food um, being grown in the spaces. So I just kind of fell deeper in love with this work and I just feel really blessed to now have the opportunity to do it full time with Sea Blossoms. Um, and I've been in my role for about about a year. Amazing. Um, I want to read your capstone. <laughs> um, but I think that you're bringing you brought up something that's important that I'd love for us to sort of weave throughout this is that I'm noticing a lot of us, um, myself included, you know, work for agricultural nonprofit. So I also think however we can help illuminate folks who are watching this video about, you know, agriculture as a career. And uh, I think, you know, nonprofit gentrification of urban agriculture is an amazing, you know, topic to be bringing into this and, and because racial justice and climate justice are, um, you know, incredibly intertwined. So I appreciate you bringing that up. And, um, and I'd love for us to, to kind of peel some layers off of that as we talk about careers. Um, Roman and Adriana, I wanted to actually ask you all, uh, you know, if you would tell us, if you would share what has been this defining moment in your work, and you might have different ones, you might share one, whatever that looks like, but um, I know you all are on like a really complex, you know, new adventure. So what is, what is a defining moment in this journey for you? Maybe you want to go first, or you go first, or I go first. You tell me, because I know we're not at, we're not together. Oh. I'm so sorry. We're not sure. You go, first. you go ahead, babe. You go ahead, and I'll follow up. We're okay. here for it. <laughs> um, so I guess a, a defining moment for me, and and I'm gonna kind of set this up just a little bit. What got me into agriculture was really food justice and food sovereignty. That was that was really what opened the door um, to me pursuing a career in agriculture. Um, and so we were just lucky enough to have the resource to be able to do that agricultural wise. Um, now a defining moment for me, um, would probably predate that. So we started off as a food truck before we had, um, a, an establishment at all, any gardens at all. And in our food truck, we had a, a pay it forward program where we would set aside tips and we would do on-site caterings for some of the shelters in town. And that was kind of a way that we figured out we could 
you know, start with our food access and food sovereignty initiative. And there was one, one catering in particular, it was a women's shelter. And um, we had a catering that was completely sponsored by the community. Um, and we showed up and we had a small menu. And there was a couple of women that pulled us aside and just said that it was the first time in a very long time that they've been able to request what they wanted to eat, <laughs> you know? So, and it just made me realize that, oh my gosh, you know, something that we just take advantage of, you know, we get, we go out to a restaurant, we order whatever we want, or if we have a hankering for something, we go and we get it. And not everybody has that um, ability. Uh, and so that was a pretty eye opening for me. It wasn't just food access, you know, I think that's when I started to hear, you know, what food sovereignty was and, and being able to decide what you eat or um, what types of food that you want to put into your body. And it, not everybody has that equal um, opportunity. And so that was, that was a big one for us. Um, and I think that's really what paved the way into our programs that we have set in place now where, you know, all of our volunteers in our community garden are eligible for a meal inside the diner. And so we've still managed to kind of keep that system going for folks that don't have the resource of growing their own food. Um, so that was pretty um, de a defining moment for me as well. How about you, babe? I'll pass it over to you. <laughs> that was good. So um, I've had I've had a very interesting journey. I I started cooking very young, um, as a professional in professional kitchens. Like at 15 years old, was involved in culinary arts. Was all about chefing it up, doing the culinary thing. Loved it. Went to school for it. Um, along the way, food changed. Um, like chicken breasts went from having an actual color to it um fat veins to like turning into these white blobs that were pumped full of saline and the flavors changed and they went from smelling like like what chicken raw chicken smells like to smelling like Clorox um over time and as I grew in the industry that stuck out to me I had an opportunity to become a high school teacher and teach culinary arts um on the high school and college level and that caused me like, I was very nervous. I started researching a lot. And around that time, that's when like the movie Food Inc came out. And I started learning more about where our food comes from and food systems in agriculture and what food systems do, um, like what big agriculture does to climate and that it's worse than jet planes and it's worse than cars and, um, the mutations of sicknesses and all these things that were just very practically given in that film. And I broke it up and gave it as lessons to my students. And in the process, it was blowing my mind. And I realized that as somebody in the food industry, I had a responsibility to know where my food is coming from. I had a responsibility to, to put money in the right places. And, and so it just kind of started there. Um, also on the, the side, other side, I was a teenager growing up in El Paso um, and the food culture out here, we have delicious food and it's terrible for you. So diabetes, heart disease, um, anything like with blood and cardiovascular, it runs deep in our Hispanic roots and especially along the border. And we just have things that are just too unhealthy for us that are clogging up our arteries. And, and I was like a 240 pound five foot seven junior in high school and I was really unhealthy. And so there was all this stirring and I, you know, Zoom later, I become the teacher. I start teaching the kids. I start gardening at home. I realize the power in it and just like the beauty in it. My kids are picking green beans in the backyard and, and it just becomes something meaningful. And um, yeah, it was, it was defining, it changed. And so, um, Along that journey, uh, I had an opportunity because I really wanted to make sure that food, but not just any food, not just like, let's fill some dry goods in a bag and give them to people, even though they're chock full processed and, and full of sodium and things like that to people, but it's free. 
you know, I know there's a place for that and people need to eat, but I wanted to go further than that. I was like, I have culinary skills. I've been working, I can do this and we can make good food for people. And I happened to cross paths with some folks that started a nonprofit community cafe here in the diner, uh, actually exactly where we are now, <laughs> all these years later. And, and after teaching, I got to open this pay it forward community cafe where we started gardens and we had a pay it forward program. And there was a need for vegan food all uh, people that were veggie heavy started coming to us because they heard we had veggies and um, something just kept going off on me. And this journey leads us up to that food truck to where I was out of a job and, and my wife was working with the city and she assisted me. I, I fell on a food truck as a loner. And I said, babe, I still need to keep the, the community fed. Like, I don't know how we do it. And I want to make sure that it's, full of plant food, you know? And so I decided like that our food truck was going to be fully vegan. I kept like a chicken breast online or something like really something just because as a safety net and I let it go as soon as we went from a food truck into a farmer's market stand, which later turned us into a, a diner. But all this while it was just realizing that like, as a young person, I didn't know better. And my whole community didn't know better. And we didn't, even if we had access to these vegetables, we didn't know what to do with them, how to be creative with them. We were just eating too unhealthy and, and making really bad food choices. And then the people that couldn't afford to do it were even worse off. And so I just wanted to make good food accessible for everybody. And then my, my wife joined me and, and we had opportunity to get these gardens and we started really started feeding people fresh food right from the gardens and made our diner completely vegan just because there's a need for that in our town. And um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think it was the food ink part that really actually changed things and got things set in motion for me to get me to where I am here. So I, you know, as I had to think about it, when you wrote those questions out, I didn't realize that it was just that little movie, you know, that made me say, hey, and turn and make the food worth something and, and know where our dollar was going to. I feel that I didn't know my moment until I had to answer this, this question once. And I was like, oh, dang, oh, I really do have like one moment. Um, so thank you for sharing that, Roman and, um, and Adriana. Um, so I'm looking at the list of questions we have, and there's one that I think probably aligns less with the climate pan or the agriculture panel than other panels. But I want to see, you know, not everyone has to answer it, but if this question moves you and you'd like to add something to the conversation, I don't want to totally gloss over it. And so um, that is, what are some challenges that you have in a career in agriculture and its alignment with climate justice? So I think we've all, you know, we're all working for sustainable or for green movements or for people's movements in agriculture. Um, so I think that's probably a more of a challenge with people who are working in big ag or maybe fields like law. Um, but is anyone here who's working in agriculture, do you find a part of your work sort of challenging with your alignment to values of climate justice? I, I can jump in quick and say that, you know, here in the Twin Cities, trying to find a clean green space for a community that needs more access to uh, fresh produce. It is frustrating, especially going through uh, rule and policies that are already in place that is just not working for the people, uh, particularly brown and black people. And so, uh, did I lose you guys? <laughs> Hi. Okay, I'm back. Sorry, I'm joining by my phone and, and I'm getting calls. So I apologize for that. But, you know, again, I, my point was, you know, having access to a space that is clean and it's not polluted is a challenge for many, many of our communities. So my goal is to, you know, try to show up in spaces where uh, our leadership is, is, they need to do better, uh, making sure that it's feasible for, for brown and black communities to have a clean space so that they can grow their own food. Yeah, thank you for centering that Naima. And I wanna make sure I'm framing the question correctly. So it's where your work and your values actually don't align. Is anyone having places where 
climate justice and their work in agriculture are like antagonistic to each other or challenges that they're finding in that? I, I might, so let me know if I'm like approaching this wrong, um, but a challenge that I have had um, is like acknowledging the like historic and like also present um, uh, just, uh, wow, I can't think of the word right now. Um, disenfranchisement, okay, of, um, as, as Naima was saying of black and brown bodies, especially in, um, in, within the food system and having programming that um, I'm like actively trying to get students of color engaged in food growing. Um, but then there's this whole history of enslavement and like immigrating from, uh, you know, from, from their, their home countries where um, they saw America as like, or the US as like a step forward and like, why would I go back to the land? Like, that's not where I should be. Um, and I think that something, something that Adri, Adriana, Adri, Adriana um, mentioned um, was framing the conversation around food justice um, and, and, and food sovereignty. And, and so I'm trying to figure out how to navigate, um, how to navigate those difficult conversations with the youth that um, we're bringing into the garden spaces and um, especially with a movement. Um, I mean, we, we have a really great diverse panel um, today, but I would say that um, a lot of times the, the nonprofits are led by white um, white people um, that don't necessarily know how to acknowledge um, the complex history between uh, people of color and in the land. Um, and so that's, that's definitely a challenge that I've, I've come across. Would anyone else like to speak to that? Oh, Adriana, I see you lit up. I did. I don't know how I did that. <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe not. But I can go. I, I, you know, I, I did. When I read this question, I think I, I don't know if I looked at it correctly or not. Um, but what I was considering was, you know, we we farm in the hot Chihuahuan desert. <laughs> you know, so for us, water conservation is a big deal. Um, and also pest management, because there are some things where you can find organic pest management uh, products, but they're not really conducive to some of what I would consider climate justice values. You know, some things that can kill aphids, but they'll also kill bees. You know, so sometimes it's, it's not even just organic practices for us. It's really kind of evaluating the environment as a whole. So the, it's a challenge, but it's not necessarily an obstacle that, you know, we can't overcome. Um, so that was kind of where I was headed in the direction. But I, as I'm hearing other folks answer, it's kind of bringing up some things that I didn't really consider for that question. <laughs> well, I think we're learning that there are actually a couple ways to like understand the question. And so that's really beautiful. And honestly, what we're here to do is hear about y'all's journey. Um, so it doesn't actually matter. Um, you know, it doesn't, well, it actually matters, but it doesn't actually matter if we take it in different directions because we're learning from you all. Um, great. So the next question I wanted to ask you, this is like, I think the crux of it, especially if we're talking to younger people who are pursuing a career in agriculture is what do you wish that you knew earlier about your job? Um, or about, how about, that you knew earlier about a career in agriculture and pursuing a career in agriculture. And I'll throw that in the chat as well. Um, Kai, would you mind starting? Yeah, I mean, I don't know like overall, but like, I just wish that in general, um, just education about agriculture was just more widespread, like that um, people, young people know that like 
food just doesn't come magically to the grocery store, comes from the ground. And so like, just like um, farming should be a normal thing. It should not be like, a, oh, it's, you know, a, a, a niche thing, which I think some people think, you know, it, it probably um, in some people's mind um, is. Um, so I just wish like when I was younger that like, you know, I grew up in the city, so like it's, it's I mean, that sentiment might, might might be different from others that grew in a rural area or, or elsewhere. But I just wish, yeah, like that, that um, kids growing up um, just realize, you know, farming is normal. Growing food is, 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 you know, that's where food comes from, the ground. Um, so like they're not, they're, they're familiar with it when, when they, they're, they're like familiar with going to, to a farmer's market, getting to know their local farmers, instead of like always expecting you know, just to have to go to a grocery store and um, getting things from, you know, thousands of miles away. Um, let's, Lauren, would you mind answering? Oh, wait, did I go for it, Naima? I know your, <laughs> your poor phone situation. <laughs> Sorry, Lauren. I was just gonna say my African family, you know, like, no, either you are a doctor or a lawyer, you know, that high ranking, um, typical, you know, careers that, you know, oftentimes people see it more appealing than a farmer. So I know for sure, you know, my family was not interested in me becoming a farmer, but yeah, I mean, I, I and, and that's one of the things is really changing uh, the face of um, what farmers will be in the coming years, right? I mean, as, as the baby boomers are retiring in high numbers, um, there is a gap in number of farmers. And so my, my work in Safa is to really increase uh, the, the number of East Africans here, particularly in the state in Minnesota, um, to get more young people interested in farming. Sorry, Lauren, <laughs> I just have to get that out. That's great. And I want to ask before we pass to Lauren, if you have a down moment as a panelist and you want to drop a link to your organization in the chat, I think that could be really cool for um, our participants to see as well. Cause I know I'm like, I'm in love with all of y'all's work. So anyway, Lauren, would you mind answering? I, I honestly don't know if I have an answer to this question um, because I'm still fairly early on in my career. Um, and I feel like I was pretty blessed in, in having so many early experiences um, working, especially with urban agriculture. Um, but I, I guess um, I, I know that I'm, not, I'm probably not gonna stay within nonprofit, um, the nonprofit work forever. And so maybe that's me taking some more time um, to figure out some of the more technical um, innovations that have come about, um, particularly with um, regenerative ag agriculture and, um, and really how, how farming at a large scale or super efficient scale happens like in urban um, communities. Uh, that's definitely something I want to learn more about, but um, I don't. I don't necessarily know if I have advice <laughs> for um, what what I what I can share about a career in in agriculture. Um, Any, I don't know. I'm rambling now. <laughs> You're good, um, Roman. Uh, Roman and Adriana. So, I mean, kind of to piggyback on what others are saying, I feel like um, before we could even share about somebody wanting to get in agriculture, it's like we need to get them wanting to get in agriculture, you know? Um, it's a situation of, of, of normalizing it, but also educating people to actually see the necessity of it and what something growing something locally what that means like when we actually put the facts together and people see it on their own they'll hopefully want to get into agriculture so i would 
probably put myself and we're so young in agriculture guys i mean i've been cooking forever but agriculture this is like this is my second growing season um and and this beyond the you know home garden stuff and i don't want to i don't want to give anybody advice on anything yet besides of like yeah jump on in we need help like this has to happen and so it's i just feel like it's really important to show people where their food is really coming from and that they have a choice and it can be done differently and it, it could be made more local and more common it could be a more powerful system for for the people rather than the corporations and things like that um but yeah we're in our second growing season it's hard but i want to tell people it's hard i want people to come in you know <laughs> I think, uh, I think for me, like, I, I know we're pretty young in, in our agricultural experience, but, you know, I think I want people to know that you, you can make a living off of this. It's not, it, had I, had anybody asked me what, you know, a farmer looks like, <laughs> or just that stereotype of an agricultural worker in, in kind of like, you know, I, I don't think of urban um, agriculture when when I hear of a farmer, and I feel like that's that's that face is really making a change. Um, I think it's a great career to step into, and I think you can really get creative on how you serve your community through food. Uh, it doesn't have to look like how Roman and I did it. There's so many ways that you can um, provide or enhance uh, food sovereignty and food justice in your local community. Um, and it started with just Roman and I, you know, it can totally start with just one person and you just need people to kind of follow suit and love the idea and it will build. And, and I think, you know, sure. people that have a heart to serve their community through food um, should absolutely take those steps and, and just kind of see what their community is already doing, see what their community is lacking and see how they can help fill those gaps. Amazing. Thank y'all for sharing those beautiful thoughts. And I, I think one of the things I'm noticing amongst all of y'all is you have found a way to create careers, you know, to create jobs that are, um, you know, hopefully paying a, a, a good wage, hopefully being a safe and a, and a good and a green job for you all. And I think oftentimes, um, you know, we don't have a lot, we don't have any farmers in here. I would say you all have figured out careers that are able to support you. And I think one of the things that young people might find entering the food system as a farm worker or, um, or a person that is farming full time is that those careers don't currently um, pay the bills. And so I think, you know, as we are talking about a, a climate movement and careers. I just want to make sure as a moderator to, to call that out that a lot of these jobs are ways that folks have found to um, to support themselves within agriculture, but that that is a really difficult thing to do as just a pure enterprise. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Did you have something to say about that, Roman? Would you? Oh, I didn't realize. I thought I was muted. I'm sorry. I was just agreeing oh. with you. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality. I mean, I just want to echo what you just said. I mean, I'm, I still have my day job and I remind people to keep your day job until you make that full transition as a farmer or whatever that, you know, area of your interest in agriculture and the food system as well. So, and that's the reality. And, you know, a lot of it has to do with the policies that are in place that are just not making it feasible for us to become a full-time farmer, you know, and so... Hopefully change will come soon because we need more farmers, young farmers. That's exactly right. And you just said the policy piece, Naima, which is that growing food should pay a living wage, right? I think we all know growing food should objectively pay a living wage. It is ridiculous that people farm after their day job. Um, so that policy component, I, I thank you for centering that too, is like, we have to be fighting for equitable jobs and for the food system to pay living wages. And, um, if anyone has questions about that, we can ask our panelists that like towards the end, we're getting close to that time, but I did want to bring us back to like a joyful place and ask all of our panelists, um, you know, pretty succinctly so we can go to the question that I've, the question I've gotten so far 
what is the thing that brings you joy in your job? You know, whether it's a moment in the field by yourself or, um, you know, the commute to work or whatever it is, I want to ask each one of you what brings you joy. And then I want to also encourage our participants to start throwing their questions in the chat. Um, Lauren, will you start? Yeah, um, just super briefly, the youth that I work with, um, seeing their curiosity and their wonder um, that kind of like mirrored mine when I was in, in, in their shoes. Um, I, it just brings me so much joy and like makes, makes it all worthwhile. Thank you. Naima, would you mind following that up? Yes, um, what brings joy to me is to see my community, uh, my fellow brown and black community come out and farm with me and just be um, and enjoy the process. You know, whether it's just holding, uh, touching the soil or just kids running around, you know, freely and um, enjoying delicious dishes. Um, I come from a communal background and we gather and we share stories and um, that just brings joy to me every time that my community is out and farming with me. Amazing. Kai, would you share with us what you find, what joy you find in your work? Yeah, so I work with a lot of older Vietnamese um, community members. Um, and so I, I grew up in the same community. So a lot of these people I work with, like I've been familiar with um, for pretty much all my life. And so like, it's really great to see like how um, passionate they are about it. And then also, you know, they're very prideful of the work that they do as well. And so like when we um, sell their produce to like a restaurant, like a well-known restaurant in New Orleans and like the chefs like really giving them like, you know, a lot of, um, you know, great comments, you know, they're, they're really proud of it. And like, I always tell people like I can re be replaced in this program and no problem. Like it was still gone. Like, but um, I'm lucky that we have the um, farmers that we do because it's their passion that that makes um, that keeps the cooperative going. So every time, I know, I, every time I, I see them, like you know, happy or or, or get props for for their work, uh, um, I'm I'm happy about it. Amazing, thank you. And how about the Plenty for the People team? All right, um, so one thing that I really love about our work and our job is that we, um, our work gives space for people to really connect to their food, um, to the community that surrounds us and to our environment. Um, and I, I really enjoy that kind of experience I know. There's that, that stay with us. And um, can you all hear me okay? Okay. Um, so we have volunteers that basically learn how to garden through our community garden. And then the produce that we have is available to the community by donation. So it's one of our programs to make sure people have access to, to food. Um, in the diner, um, they can if they need a meal, say, say they're not interested in learning how to garden, they need a meal, they can volunteer with us at least one hour um, to obtain a meal. Adriana, we're losing you. Locked up. I oh, know. Um, well, Roman, why don't we scoot over to you until we okay. get Adriana back? Yeah. Okay. So are you back, babe? I see you moving. You said donate a meal was the last thing you said that we caught. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me okay? okay? Okay. Sorry about that. So yeah. So sometimes we get folks in that aren't interested in gardening at all. And then they end up volunteering with us so that they can get meals. And, and I do have some volunteers that have actually committed weekly because of that. They were never interested in gardening to begin with. <laughs> so sometimes they pull them in by, by the food, but then they find an appreciation for gardening. Yeah. And that's like the beauty of, of um, when I get to see that transition 
in folks that that um, find find what we've found in gardening. Um, so it's really cool to have a space that can can you know create that. Yeah, and it certainly feels like it's it's all of ours. You know what I mean? Like we're the gatekeepers. We hold the key and pay the rent. You know, but it really is the community's garden and it's the community's meeting space. So the pandemic was interesting, you know, but but beyond that, it having everybody around and just the sense of this natural built community. We weren't trying to build community. We were just trying to come into the community that's already here, that's already going and just say, hey, you know, let's get some vegetables in you and just take it from there. And it it has turned into this own thing. And then to do it side by side with with my life partner, you know, like my person that we have 20 years together and, and um, always found ourselves working together to serve the community uh, together um, to watch our, our volunteers grow, to watch us grow. It's just like, it really is all about growth, right? You put the seeds in the ground and put the water and you watch little things grow from that sprout to the volunteer that like had never eaten asparagus and you know, was afraid to touch kale. And now they're growing it and they're eating it raw and they're taking it home and they're cooking it, uh, you know? And, and for us to put that seed in the ground and watch it grow and say, hey, we did this together. It's, it's just the growth of it all. And this business, uh, the nonprofit and the for-profit is in this constant evolution, constant change, because we feel like it's our responsibility to be, um, flexible to the needs of the community otherwise then why are we a community diner <laughs> you know so we have if as a community moves and molds and changes we try to go with it and do it and it just brings growth um on so many levels so that's my just growing and then and doing it with with my wife it's it's the best thank you so much for that roman and i want to respect everybody's time um but we did ask if there were any questions from the audience so what I will say is we'll do a step up, step back, right? Um, I'm gonna ask our panelists, if you have a feeling on this and you would like to answer it, please um, please step up and answer it. And if you feel like maybe other people have the answers to this and we could just have you know one good answer, let's honor that as well. And so this question came from Fatima and it is, um, regarding farm workers, where do you see yourself standing in solidarity with farm workers and their well-being within your work? So maybe within your organizations and how do your organizations contextualize themselves to farm workers and how can we center the rights and justice for farmers who are subjects of colonial and imperial systems that produce our mainstream food system? So I think this is a really overarching question of the thing that we talked about earlier today, this food system is not just, and we have all found careers within it. Um, so how do you sort of contextualize yourself or relate to the folks who have not um, because, in, in, because of American imperialism? Would anyone? Sure, I'll, I'll say something really briefly. Um, with specifically with my work, especially because I don't know if I would really classify myself as a farmer. I, I'm like a garden based educator. Um, but the way that I kind of use my platform to um, uplift those those voices, those marginalized voices is by being on um, like coalitions and movements that are actively, um, you know, put it put forward, like policy change. Um, so I'm on the Good Food Purchasing Program Coalition um, in DC, which is actually a, a national initiative. So um, I encourage if, if you um, want to explore if the, if the Good Food Purchasing Program is in your city, um, you should definitely look into that. Um, and they're centered on five values, which is um, valued workforce. So ensuring uh, workers' rights are respected um, supporting local economies, specifically um, BIPOC farmers. Um, there's animal welfare, environmental sustainability, and nutrition. So those are kind of the five values within the Good Food Purchasing Program, and institutions will kind of sign on to that commitment to fulfill um, 
you know, a higher standard for, for purchasing um, on a city level. Thank you so much. Is anyone or any of our other panelists um, moved to speak about their relationship to folks who are maybe not thriving within our food system? We are at time. Did I feel like somebody just came off mute? No? Okay. We are at time um, and I just am incredibly appreciative of the space that was created here tonight and the, the like words of our panelists and what we got to learn from them. Um, Lauren, thank you for that sort of policy and coalition answer to that question. I don't wanna leave it totally hanging in the air. Um, there are so many coalition-based organizations that anyone who's listening can, can jump in and just do policy fights, whether it's sign-ons, um, you know, the food worker, um, food chain workers Alliance is one, um, or even just United farm workers, just making sure to boost their signal as well. Um, and I am just incredibly thankful for the time that you all created, uh, for us to ask you these questions here tonight. Um, yeah, I guess, I think that's it. I guess we're closing. Would anyone like to say anything in closing? Any wrapping words? Well, I just want to say thanks. And also, I just want to shout out to Margie as well. She does some amazing work in New Orleans uh, educating folks. So I want to make sure she gets uh, some recognition as well. Thanks. Hi. <laughs> awesome. Well, I've so enjoyed being with you all. And um, follow our panelists on Instagram and on their websites and their Facebooks. And um, yeah, we hope that you find a career in agriculture. Thank y'all so much. Enjoy your Tuesday nights.